Now I'd like you, as an inspired church does best in the world, let's give uh, Apostle Mike Connell a huge welcome to the platform here and there. Thank you. Come on, let's give Jesus a clap. We owe him everything. Thank you, Lord. We honor you. We praise you. We give you the glory, and we invite you to come and powerfully change us. Touch our lives, Lord. Amen. Wow, please be seated. Look, what a wonderful crowd of people. My. Great. So good to be here with you. And, uh, and you know, Pastor Don's been trying to get me to come a while. We've been mainly up in Asia. I, I love Asia, and I'm sort forever up there. And, uh, but uh, just great with the lockdown. The lockdown has been good for us. Had the time to enjoy at home and the time to connect. And, uh, and uh, the Lord spoke to me. He said, don't waste this gift of time. Don't waste this gift of time. And uh, so just a wonderful, what an amazing facility you have. Just a great facility here coming in and just the quality of everything that's around. I love it. And just really good. And I, I first met Don, I think, back in, uh, would have been back in the move of God in about 95 or 6. And, and uh, someone in our city had the bright idea of running combined churches, you know, move of God. And, and they asked this guy, Pastor Don McDonnell from somewhere up north who I'd never heard of before to come to this meeting. It was these were the wildest times. Well it was I have never forgotten that. And I think it was the uh, Assembly of God pastor that invited Don to come because he knew him. And uh, I think we carried him into every meeting and carried him out of the meeting. I mean he was out to it under the Holy Ghost. Anyway, so we come from uh I can, we come from the Hawke's Bay, and uh, Joe and I met at university, and uh, we're both doing, studying science. I, I graduated with a master's, and then uh, we, we had broken hearts as a result of that season. I come from a Catholic background, and Joy come from a, uh, uh, a brethren background. So we faced quite a number of challenges and entered marriage really with deep wounds in the heart that you didn't even know were there, really. And, uh, but over the course, we started Christian school, we passed a church in Danivik, then shifted up to Hastings, where there was a church broken down, about a dozen people perhaps, and thousands of dollars of debt. And uh, that was where our ministry just went from strength to strength. We made a commitment that we'd let the Lord have deeper access to our hearts and lives, went through a season of quite deep healing in the heart, and then we had a move of deliverance that just wouldn't stop, went on for so long. And we became, it was a new life church. They called it the Wildlife Center. It was just, it was so wild, the stuff that would happen there. And so the church grew and uh, we uh, outgrew what we were in, went into a, a high school and then into the building we're in now, which is a monster building. It's amazing. And uh, then over the years, we, we've done missions work out into the nations of the earth and have got, uh, have seen Bible school set up and uh, gone doing equipping in a whole range of different nations. And it's just amazing how the simplest things can, can cause something great to happen. Uh, I was, uh, we were just up at a campsite just the other day with some Asians, and uh, I remember standing there at a pastor's conference, walked out, and there's this uh, man, and he's as black as they can be. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Fancy finding you here. Who are you? And he said, uh, he told me his name, and he's from Uganda. I said, that's amazing. I introduced myself, and so I got talking to him and found out he was a pastor. I said, well, what did he come to New Zealand for? And uh, he said, well, God told me to come to New Zealand. And I said, that is, that's amazing. I said, why did he want you to come to New Zealand? So he says, I'm going to meet some people here, and they're going to make a difference in my life. And immediately I felt in my heart, that's me. So we took him home, took him back down to, uh, <laughs> back down to the bay, got to know him, heard his testimony, invested in him. And then we set up a Bible school over there, bought land, set up a church. Now there's about 300 churches he's planted. But who would have realized that just from saying hello to the gardener that something so big would happen? And you often don't really know just how in the connections that you make in life, what will come of them. Sometimes the most amazing things come out of them. Amen? Okay, well, if you've got a Bible with you, why don't you open up your Bible? If you're looking online, great to have you here with us. And we trust that uh, whatever we share here, the Holy Spirit will inspire you and touch you. This is called Inspire Church, so you're going to be inspired. And uh, when we pray for people, the same anointing here will be there where you are. All you've got to do is just be open to receive what God has. Amen? Okay, well, I want you to open your Bible with me, and we're going to look in, uh, we're going to look in uh, Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verses 10. I want to, I'm going to speak this morning... Uh, a message called the spirit of infirmity. I find in working in Western churches, there's very, very little understanding of the supernatural realm. 
this church would be an exception to that, but on the whole, very little awareness, and yet this is a massive problem. I remember, uh, and even when I was teaching as a very young believer, uh, teaching uh, physics and, and whatever in high school, uh, I, the Lord showed me how to bring His presence into the classroom. And as a result of that, we saw a whole number of things happen. Uh, we saw, like, there were two girls just walked by, and uh, they stood outside the, the door, and they said, Hey, Sue, what's wrong with your room? I said, What do you mean, what's wrong with my room? And they said, Well, it's, uh, it's weird. We go by here, we shake. I thought, man, shaking outside a classroom, that's a new one. Come on in, let me have a look. So he came in, they came in, and, and sure enough, they're shaking like a leaf. And they said, this is the only room this happens in in the whole school. And, uh, and immediately the lights went on because the Lord had told me to stand in my authority as the owner of that territory, assigned to that territory of that classroom, that every, and to pray every day, take authority over spirits and release the peace and blessing of God into the room and, and decree productivity and learning would happen and uh and and now of course I didn't feel anything but they're feeling that presence and uh I saw oh, you girls been involved in the occult haven't you and they said yes we have how did you know and uh so as a result of that we started a movement of God in the church in the school it's just amazing but I that was one of my first uh, understandings of how as believers you're called to build spiritual atmospheres and you're called to occupy and advance the kingdom wherever you are so anyway, so we're going to go into this passage here, and uh, I, I won't, I'm going to just give a couple of introductory thoughts. Uh, many Christians don't understand what it means to be a child of God. We, we kind of have a Western thinking about it and don't understand biblical concepts so well. So, for example, in the Bible, when we use the term son or the word daughter, they come from the same root, it means one who builds the father's house one who extends the father's house, a person who acts as a representative of their father. So when you're born into the family of God, every one of us is called to mature, but we're called to be a representative of our father and to advance his kingdom wherever we are. So that makes all sons and daughters ministers of God wherever you are. You've got to learn how to do it. So, so the thing is that God anoints each of us for the assignment he gave us. So if you're called to business, you're called to business. If you're called to teaching, it's teaching or health or welfare, whatever it is. In that arena, God wants to bring forth his kingdom and to manifest his power in that arena. And so all of us as sons of God are called firstly to intimacy with our father, to know him, engage with him and have a relationship with him. Secondly, to an assignment that's unique to us. And then thirdly, to transform or be changed because if we're going to represent our Father, we need to know Him, and we need to actually let Him change us to become like Him. So when we read the passage here, you understand that Jesus is operating as a son, and he's, He flows out of intimacy with His Father. He flows led by the Holy Ghost. Secondly, He fulfills an assignment. And so you'll see that very clearly in this. I'm going to open this passage up for you and show it to you. And, and I want you to understand that whatever arena you're in, you also are anointed to carry the presence of God there and bring a shift. And uh, so I want to open the story up. And so we'll go through it. Some of you may read it, some may not. Let's just read the passage, Luke 13, 10, and go through to verse 17, just seven verses. Now, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. And behold, there was a woman had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and she was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. She's really in bad shape. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to himself and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. Immediately, she was made straight and glorified God. So that's the first part. It's the, the ministry to two areas of need she had. But there's a third area, and we'll explain this in a moment. And, said, and the ruler of the synagogue answered uh, with indignation or anger. He's very angry because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And so he spoke, didn't speak to Jesus, spoke to the crowd. There's six days which men ought to work. Come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. And now the Lord responds. He said, he answered him and said, hypocrite, didn't each one of you on the Sabbath day lose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bowed, 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and the multitude rejoiced for all the things that were done. So 
this woman, uh, th- this situation that takes place, and there's, there's so many stories of G- what Jesus did. They couldn't, they had to condense them and just tell you a key ones. So within every story, there's huge insights to the kingdom and to what God is like. And so this is one of those stories. So it, it, Jesus in a synagogue, it doesn't say where the synagogue was. He was there and no doubt he was preaching, teaching the word of God. And there's a supernatural encounter with a person. And it's recorded so that we can get an insight and an understanding on a number of things. This lady had three distinct problems. Let me explain exactly what they are, and then I'll open up and share a bit more. Then we'll look how that would apply into our life. So the first thing is obvious. She, she had a severe physical disability. The, the Bible tells us she was totally bent over, which means she's bent down like this. And when you're bent down like that, your life is enormously handicapped. Uh, secondly, it tells us she had a spirit of infirmity. That was the cause of the physical disability, a spirit of infirmity, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But there's a third issue that she was wrestling with. In a community like that, which is not a Western community, it's a Middle Eastern and therefore an honor-shame culture, uh, uh, when people have, uh, are disfigured or have disabilities, it brings great shame on family. And so they usually try to keep them hidden, and uh, they avoid them. So she's struggling with three issues. Number one, a spirit of infirmity causing physical disability and causing great shame and a life of tremendous suffering. So we're going to open up and just share a little bit about each of these things and these areas and how Jesus addresses not just the demon, but addresses the whole person to restore her. So so if you look in there, it, t- it tells us there, first of all, Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about spirits. What is a spirit of infirmity? Western culture often doesn't understand spirit things. And so it becomes a mystery and we then want to avoid it because we don't understand about it. But you as a believer, as a child of the living God, are called to understand that realm and to bring the realm of God into wherever you are. You're called to overcome the demonic realm wherever it seeks to destroy, whether it be marriage, family, finances, whether it be uh, friends or around in the church, wherever. There's There's an ongoing warfare, and there's no neutrality in the warfare. There's none at all. So for every one of us, we're born into a kingdom, we're aligned with a king, and now there's a warfare goes on for your future, for your legacy, and for the things God has called for you. So even for us, although we've been ministering for years, our warfare now is not just for our children, because all of them are in God and in the church, it's for the grandchildren and the next layer of legacy. So in other words, we're never, we're never here just for ourselves. We're here for the generations. We're here to advance the kingdom of God. And so if you only think in terms of yourself, you'll never think in terms of building anything that lasts. Whatever you have will be yours, and then there's nothing left. So there's always a warfare around legacy. There's always a warfare around the things of the spirit. So this, this lady had a spirit of infirmity. I mean, she had a demonic spirit. What is a demonic spirit? It's an evil spirit being. It has a personality, a character. It has a shape and a form. And the Bible tells us our warfare is against these. And uh, she had this demonic spirit. It's a disembodied spirit that looked for and found a place to enter. And a lot of people don't understand this, but this warfare goes on all the time, everywhere, every person. Every person, because of the unique destiny we are called to, has spirits assigned against us to exploit your vulnerabilities, the weaknesses, the wounds, the places in your heart where you're open and vulnerable. Every person will end up either wrestling or being overcome by these spirits and impacted in their life and family somehow. I find when I counsel and work with people, I find frequently, if not nearly all the time, the problems the people are wrestling with began in the generations before them and no one has ever stood up and brought it to an end. And so wherever you are in your journey and whatever has come against you to rob and steal and destroy, God calls you to step up and overcome it. Uh, get the idea? So, so when demonic spirits come, they come in different kinds and uh, different types. The, 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 the way you'd best describe it is the activity of the demon really describes what its name is, or its name describes its activity, spirit of rejection, spirit of fear. This year, we've seen fear unleashed everywhere. 
And when fear is unleashed everywhere, people then try to control their life and circumstances and relationships, and then they start to engage and become under the bondage of wicked spirits. So uh, you notice here it says she had a particular spirit, and uh, this spirit was a spirit of infirmity. The word infirmity means to be weak or feeble or without strength. So what does a spirit of infirmity do? A spirit of infirmity can initiate sickness in a person. A spirit of infirmity can stop people being healed after they've had a trauma. So I found most times if people have a traumatic experience, if there's a delay in them healing and coming right, it's frequently a spirit of infirmity that entered and, and held them back. And so this woman, the Bible tells us 18 years ago, at, at some point or for some reason, a spirit entered her life and then changed her future. And uh, so this is her day of encounter. So spirits of infirmity, if they get into people, can cause all kinds of havoc, all kinds of problems. And that raises the questions, well, how do they get in? And even more important, how do you get them out? How do you get them out? So I find in some cultures I go, spirits of infirmity, uh, they're everywhere. But in other cultures, they're different kind of things that seem to be predominant. So how does the spirit of infirmity enter? Sp evil spirits cannot gain access to a person's life unless a door of opportunity is opened. Unless a door of opportunity. So demons never come and announce themselves. They look to deceive people and find doors into their life. And I have found people, they've, they've been living in bondage for almost all of their life and hadn't realized that behind it is something demonic driving and empowering the problem. I had a pastor come to me a little while ago, not so long ago, and uh, he was sexually assaulted when he was about seven, and he'd been in torment for all of those years, now in his 50s. And when we prayed for him and dealt with the roots in his heart and then commanded the spirits to go, he said, my life transformed. So you see you've got out there transforming lives. I love it. That's part of the mission of the church, transforming lives. But you can't do it totally unless you acknowledge the ministry of deliverance. When spirits get into people, they empower problems and issues. So I said to the man, I said, after we prayed for you, what happened? He said, my wife wondered what had happened to me. My kids wondered what happened to me. The church even noticed what happened to me. I said, well, tell me from your experience what happened. He said, well, the anger left. I was no longer reactionary all the time. I said, he said, secondly, the voices I kept hearing in my head were totally gone, totally gone. And I said, did you realize that you have been listening to demonic spirits that entered your life through the trauma and agreeing with them all your life, and this has caused you to live in torment? And he said, I realize that now they've gone. And so his ministry has just gone from strength to strength. So spirits enter people to torment them. They literally energize the problems. They make things that perhaps you could manage unable to be managed. They just cause such pressure inside people's lives. And so how do, how do spirits enter in? Well, a whole number of ways they could enter in. How would a spirit of infirmity have entered into this woman? Well, it could have been generational. One of, the, one of the things we find wherever we go is that many people are wrestling with issues that their parents wrestled with and never got the victory. In other words, you're the next generation standing up and God wants you to bring an end to whatever that thing was so you can build something better for the next generation. Okay? So we can't think just one generationally. So it could be generational. In my own family, I had no idea of these things until we started to pray into it and explore, and then we realized that there were, uh, there were uh, particular spirits and curses operating in our family that operate for, for a long time. And once they were broken, we were able to change the dynamic of what was happening in our family. I had a, 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 a woman rang me up one time, and she said, could you come around and pray for my child? I said, what's the problem? She said, well, he wakes up every morning and he starts to tear things and destroy things. If we don't wake up before him, there's destruction. I, so I asked a few questions and I found the, uh, the father had been a very angry, violent man, been involved with drugs. Her, her father had been involved in, uh, uh, in the occult. And so we went in there and when the child was asleep with the parents' presence, we prayed and commanded all of those things that had been imparted to the child to leave. And the outcome was very simple. The next day I woke up, there was no damage. There was nothing. It never repeated itself again. So there, I get lots of stories like this. They're really, some of them are really interesting stories, just of people who get set free. And they, they, 
had no idea that what they were wrestling with was a spiritual bondage that Jesus came to release them from. So it could be uh, generational, families involved in Freemasonry, families involved in the occult, families involved in any religious group, family involved in perverse sexual activities. I remember praying for one child, the mother said, brought the child to me and said, look, there's something wrong with my daughter. She has these vivid dreams and they're all very unclean sexual dreams. I said, has she been molested in any way? No, they've been very careful. And I said, talk to me about your background. They talked about the background and it was evident why the child was struggling because there were patterns where they'd opened, the parents had both opened their lives up to the demonic realm through sin and now the child has got the legacy of their previous sin. Were the parents forgiven? Yes, they were. But that didn't undo the damage. The damage, you have to address it. Amen? So anyway, it tells us there that <clears throat> uh, it had happened 18 years before. So that means it wasn't generational. Perhaps uh, it may have been a trauma. Whenever people have a traumatic experience, that can be a birth trauma, can be a trauma in the womb, can be something growing up, can be a person is assaulted. Remember, there's these people were living under the dominion of the Romans, and so possibly she was sexually abused by a Roman soldier. The Bible doesn't give the details, but a trauma opens the door for spirits of infirmity, and people can't seem to move on or get over it. That's why you'll find frequently in the paper, if you ever watch and someone got held up at a dairy and they were robbed, you find if you follow the story, frequently they never can get back into work again because the trauma and the spirits that have affected their life hinder them or have destroyed their, their, their whole life. Uh, and another doorway of entry for uh, spirits of infirmity is through idolatry, uh, people involved actively in the worship of any idols, or indirectly through Freemasonry or through things like that, where people enter into uh, involvement with idols. It could, come, could have come through spiritism. If you've been involved in fortune-telling or magic or sorcery, anything like that, that would have opened the doorway. And you think, oh, well, that sort of sounds as that's all Bible stuff. Actually, it's very relevant. I prayed for one pastor's son, and uh, he's, I said to him, um, and this is what the problem was, uh, he, he was involved in drugs, and... Uh, he, they get him clean, and then he's back in it again, back in it again, back in it. And this, then they said a couple of interesting things. They said, it doesn't matter where he goes, they always find him. And he said, it's unbelievable. Even he stepped out of the hospital or the place he was staying, and there was someone out there waiting for him who didn't even know him. And I said, oh, that's a cultic. I said, there's something marking him in the spirit. And so I, I said to the young man, I said, well, did you ever in any time in your life, make any agreement with evil spirits? He said, no, 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 no. And he said, oh, oh, yeah. So I kind of cut myself one time and asked the devil to come into my life. Would that count? I said, yeah, it would count. The father <laughs> had no idea. But you see, the son had gone through turmoil when the father planted the church. And uh, they were in another nation. The upheaval and loss of his friends left him in pain. The starting of the church was stressful and full of spiritual warfare. And in the middle of it all, he'd become embittered against the parents and the doorway opened up for spirits to come. And then he got involved uh, in all these things. So we prayed and broke the power of that uh, agreement with the devil, broke and commanded the spirit off his life. He had a massive deliverance. And from that point on, he's just like had never anyone approach him again. It's like, see, these are, these, uh, as I say, I've got lots of stories like this, but these are people who got free, and it's because we help them understand the reality of the spirit world, that there's things around. Uh, another way they could have come, here's another one. I was in uh, Asia one time, as I, as I love being up there, and uh, uh, we were teaching in the Bible school, a lot of young people, and the Lord spoke to me about video games. And I saw there's someone here addicted to games, to gaming. You can't get off. You can play 24 hours in a row and not stop. And I said, and you want to stop, but you can't get off it. Who's that person? So the young guy put his hand up and came up. And uh, so we, we stopped to talk with him a little bit. And I found, I said, what game are you playing? He said, oh, it's a, it's a game called Dungeons and Dragons. No, it was something like that, Dungeons and Dragons. What was it? Hmm? World of Warcraft, that's right, World of Warcraft. And so I said, well, tell me a bit more about it. He told me he played the part of a sorcerer. And I said, well, Jesus said this, if you look at a woman and imagine evil and your heart's desire is set on that, sin conceives in your heart. So I said, you're looking on screen 
and you're longing for the power of that uh, identity in the screen, you have actually opened yourself up to the spirit of witchcraft or sorcery. He was shocked. I said, here you are, you've given up a year of your life to be in Bible school learning about the Lord, and in your private time, you're engaging in sorcery, and you can't tell. So I got him to renounce the game, renounce the identity, and the moment he did his countenance change, he screamed and fell on the floor, and then he got delivered. And of course, all the other students saw this, and the Lord said, well, there's a lot more of them doing the same thing. So I said, well, how many others? And then we had 200. Now get this, 200 great young men and women of God who were believers at a Bible school to learn about Jesus. And in their private time, they're seduced into hooked into sorcery and not even know what they're connecting to. So there are lots of things that can catch people up. Bitterness and unforgiveness will open the door for infirmity. And people don't realize that when Jesus said in Matthew 18, 35, he said, if you don't forgive from the heart, then you will be delivered to tormentors. So what he's saying is that unforgiveness opens the realm of your life to the demonic to come. I had one young guy come up on an altar call for an for a, a, a injured shoulder. And uh, as he came, the Lord said, he's got bitterness. This is a spirit of infirmity. There's bitterness in his heart towards his father. So I just said to the young guy, I said, well, tell me, uh, is there, uh, how do you get on with your dad? He said, oh, I love my dad. And uh, I said, oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> and I said, oh, he's a traveler, isn't he? He goes all over the world. He, he said, that's right. He said, isn't it true you're angry he was never there for you? And the boy said, yes, that's true. So he forgave his dad and renounced the spirit of infirmity. We prayed he got delivered and totally healed. And then he said to me, he said, actually, Pastor, he said, the, the, yesterday I was at the doctor's and he said, every part of my body is seizing up. I'll soon be immobilized. He said, he said I, I came up for the shoulder, but actually I'm in pain, I've been in pain everywhere. And now suddenly he's totally healed. Isn't that amazing? So, so bitterness and unforgiveness can open your life to tormenting spirits of all kind. You notice it said, in the story, it said, she had the spirit of infirmity 18 years. Now, we read it, and those sort of things don't mean so much for them, but for the, for the people there, the number 18, see, they're well-versed in their Bible, and they would remember back to the book of Judges, two instances where when they forsook the Lord, they went into bondage for 18 years, exactly 18 years. One's found in Judges chapter 3, verse 14. They had 18 years under the Moabites, and then the other was found in Judges 10, 8, 18 years under the Philistines and Ammonites. So when Jesus is saying she had this infirmity for 18 years, he's saying this woman is like the whole country of Israel that is in bondage to demonic spirits, and I've come to set her free. And this is where so many people find themselves. So, so anyway, we go there and we have a look in, in the story. So you notice now she has a spirit of infirmity. The spirit of infirmity has now caused an affliction in her body. Now get this, she's bent over like this. Now y- you try, just think about this, try to walk when you bend over like that. I mean, that's about as good as it gets. You can't see anything except what's in front of you and you can't move quickly. So think about how long it took for her to get there. Everything about the story, if you look into it, tells you the woman is seriously, seriously afflicted. Like she's not got a vision for where she could go. She can't look in the faces of people. All she can see is the feet. She's bent totally over like this. This is major distortion. And so within her culture, not only has she got the spirit of infirmity and this major affliction in her body, she's also hated and cursed and she would be abused by people. So this is a big deal for her to be at the church. It's taken her a long time to get to the church. You try it. You bend yourself over like that, then try and see how long it takes you to go out that door to the coffee bar. It'll take you a long time. Even to get out of your seat and come up for prayer would be a long time. So there's everything about this. The the, the story is there to help us understand that when we let go of God, our lives become bound, our vision stolen, and we become under spirit powers. And so God's wanting to restore people. So let's have a look at see it. Notice here what Jesus did. It says, when he saw her. So if you look in the story there, Jesus is teaching and preaching, and suddenly he sees the woman. She won't be at the front. She'll be right at the very back because of the potential embarrassment and rejection by people in the church. And there she is and says he saw her. Now, here's the most amazing thing. Jesus stops what he's doing to engage her. 
What we don't see so often is just what's going on. Jesus said, I do the things I see my father doing. So he's in the middle of preaching, suddenly stops, and, and, there's a, and he points the woman out, and he sees the woman, just like he sees you. Wherever your life is bowed down by anything, he sees it. And it says, this is what he did. He, he then stops what he's doing, which is a shock anyway, and then he calls the woman to come. So notice he's initiating this is the heart of God. Jesus came to reveal what the Father's like. He initiates a confrontation in the church with the culture of the church. He initiates something that's going to set off and trigger a problem to expose and uncover that the church in his day was disconnected from the heart of God, that it actually didn't understand the heart of God to heal the broken. And so he doesn't just pray for her. He calls her out the front. Now, for her to get out the front, so you see, he called her to himself. And so for her to get out, up to the front, remember, this is about all she can do. So the whole atmosphere is full of tension about what's about to happen. No one's saying anything. He suddenly shifted the whole atmosphere, stopped the preaching. This lady is on the way up, and everyone wonders what's going to go. And then he does a couple of things that actually astonishes people. In that culture, a rabbi would never speak to a woman. And secondly, a rabbi would never touch a woman because it would render him ceremonially defiled. And Jesus demonstrates that, there's, that the power of the Spirit is greater than anything outside us that can defile us. He taught there's nothing outside defiles you. It's what's in your heart is what defiles you. So he brings the woman up, and you notice then, be loosed. And he speaks to that spirit dimension, and the spirit immediately goes out of the woman. Then he put his hands on her, and she's healed. Straightens up, begins to give glory to God. You can imagine the total upheaval in that place. He is demonstrating this is the heart of God. It's to heal, it's to restore, it's to connect to broken people, and there's nothing he's ashamed of or frightened of connecting to. We were just talking before how uh, both of us had the same experience. We've been in Asia, and they tried to hide us from the parts of the town which, which were seedy. And I said, but these are the very places that pe Jesus came to heal people. Why would you pretend like it's not happening when it's happening everywhere? And so in this one story then, this woman, because it's 18 years, everyone understands that represents the whole nation of Israel in bondage and out of the will of God because they're serving substitutes for God. And suddenly, Jesus demonstrates forgiveness and love and compassion and sets her free. It stuns everyone there. Now you get to the second part of the story, which is just amazing. It says, the leader of the synagogue was, was, was angry, extremely angry. Why? And then what happens next is something, if you don't understand the culture, you won't understand what Jesus does. Remember we said three things, spirit of infirmity, physical infirmity, and now the third thing is the shame. Now, in the, the culture of the Middle East, as it is in Asia, in the Pacific, in South America, and Africa, is not a Western culture. And our problem when we look at the Bible is we look through the Western filter, Western cultural eyes, and we look through the eyes of individuals because we're an individualistic culture. Whereas for the culture of that day, it's very much a community culture. It's very much about the family, an extended family, and it's very much about honor and shame. So the things in those cultures, even to this day, everyone fears losing face. Everyone fears being dishonored, and people want to be honored. So what is honor? Honor means, in that sense, the community placing a high value on you as a person. And so for you to be highly valued or honored as a person, then you either got it from your family background, you were born into it, or if you didn't get it from there, if you're a wealthy benefactor or a, you fought in the, in the, among the gladiators or fought in the army, then you could gain great honor. So honor was the commodity everyone wanted. They believed there's not enough honor to go around, and so they would have honor competitions. And every time Jesus engaged with the Pharisees, it was never about the questions. It was always an honor challenge. So what happens now in this story, as in most of the stories where Jesus met the Pharisee leaders, there's an honor challenge. So remember, honor 
means the community places value on you. Shame means they place no value on you and cut you off. And so you could uh, have shame on your life because of the family you came from, the name and reputation of the family. See, in, that, in those cultures, they don't ask your name. They ask the name of your father, where you came from. So, so, so uh, you can lose it for a whole number of reasons. Anyway, this woman is in a place of shame, a place where the community avoid being with her, avoid connecting to her, avoid helping her. Life is extraordinarily hard. And Jesus now is about to deal with the issue of shame. The leader of the Pharisees sets up what's called an honor challenge. An honor challenge <clears throat> had four parts. The first part uh, it always is always in public. You said someone said or did something like Jesus just done. The second part is where he's challenged publicly. So when the leader of the synagogue speaks out, he's not speaking to Jesus. He speaks to the whole of the crowd, and he's now challenging him over the Sabbath. Everyone understands this is an honor challenge. In an honor challenge, the person is challenged publicly, and they have to respond. And the crowd decides the response. So someone says or does something, there's an honor challenge. The person responds, and the crowd decides who the winner is. That's how it works. So in those situations, someone walked out with honor, and someone walked out losing face. That's how it works. And, of course, any of you who have been in Asia understand that losing face is something to be avoided at all costs. People do anything. They will not even tell you the truth to avoid losing face. Sometimes they won't even say no to you to avoid losing face. It is a big issue in that culture. Maybe not in a Western culture. We don't understand it. For us, honor and shame are more personal, individualized things that have happened to us. But in these cultures, and this is the culture of the Bible, this is very significant. So now what the leader has done, he's issued a challenge publicly that this is the Sabbath. You shouldn't work on the Sabbath. In other words, it's a very religious challenge. And it does not carry the heart of God at all. That's why Jesus responds. So the next line, Jesus is now responding to the honor challenge. And here's how he responded. He said, number, the first thing he says, you're a hypocrite. You're a play actor. You're, you're acting a part as though you speak for God, but you do not carry the heart of God at all. That's what he's saying. You're just an actor. You're not authentic. That's a terrible thing to have Jesus say to us that we're just acting being Christians, pretending, but it's not authentic, able to spout Bible verses, but have no knowledge of the heart of God. And then he, he says this, don't you on a, every man, every one of you. So he's now not just talking to the leader of the synagogue, he's talking to the whole group of leaders that are up on the stage. Does not each one of you, so he's now spread it. He's actually confronting the whole church system of his day. And he says, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath day, if you have an ox, untie it and lead it to water and then bring it back? And that's exactly what they all did. That was allowed for in the, in the, in the, in the, in the book in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And so that's what they would do. So he's saying, you all do that. In other words, he's saying, on the Sabbath, you all show kindness to an animal. How much more then should this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, be loosed from Satan's bondage on the Sabbath? So he's saying you, you're so far removed from understanding the heart of God, you've got everything wrapped up around church meetings and doing things this way or that way, and you've lost the heart of God. And notice if you fit to the last verse there, it said, and his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced. So you see immediately in there, this is an honor challenge. And Jesus has walked away honored, they have walked away shamed. And if you look and read through the New Testament, you find over and over and over, it's the same thing. Every time they struggle to try and catch him out, he actually always had the word of wisdom of God to answer it. They walked away ashamed until it says, they asked him no more questions, but rather came together to see how we could kill him. How about that? Now, notice this also, that the way they wanted to kill him was not just by poisoning him. They could have slipped something in the soup. Or they could have had someone lay in wait behind, the, behind the, the, the house. They wanted to publicly crucify him because crucifixion 
again, from the Middle Eastern point of view, is not about the pain, it's about the dishonor. It's about shaming someone so much that no one would ever want to follow them again. And so in the story, we see then a woman representing the whole nation of Israel, the religious leaders representing the leadership of its hour, totally disconnected from the heart of God. And Jesus, as a son, is saying, this is my mission. I've come to find the brokenhearted. I've come to find the people who are broken and call them back into relationship and demonstrate the heart of God is to forgive them and heal them, deliver them, restore them, and to put honor back on them. The last thing that happens to the woman, this has never happened anywhere else in the Bible, is in front of everyone, he calls her a daughter of Abraham. In other words, he honors her and singles her out as worthy of great honor. Why did he call her that? Because she came with faith in her heart. The, she came with faith in her heart. Others came to watch. She came hungry and believing God could touch her life and bring a transformation. How about that? That's what drew Jesus, caused him to stop what he's doing and draw towards her. It's not just that he saw her there. He feels the pull of faith. Faith has got an attractive pull. It pulls the things of God into your life. She must have heard about Jesus. She's living a miserable life with no future. And she thinks, this is, if I can just get near him, I'll get a miracle. Faith will unlock you out of the prison the devil has put you in. Faith will set you free from the bondage to spirits that hold you down. Now, she had a spirit of infirmity, but fear holds people down too. Fear stops people being who they're called to be. Fear stops people from being free. Fear causes us to try and control life to make it safe for us. It, it could just as easy have been rejection. A spirit of rejection will cause you to think nobody could accept you, nobody could love you, nobody would want you, and you can be in a community of people who are loving and caring and still believe there's no love in this place. The problem is your heart can't receive it because of the bondage of your heart. So fear can bow people down. Poverty can bow people down. We've seen, we were just talking with a friend the other day, and, and, uh, and, uh, and he was sharing about this woman. She comes with a huge amount of money, but cannot hardly spend a cent of it. It's like poverty has still got a grip on her life. So, so poverty can hold you down. It stops you seeing the possibilities. See? Fear will hold you down. Rejection will hold you down. See, traumas will hold you down. What is holding you back this year? What is holding you down and keeping you so your eyes are focused on the ground and what's immediately in front of you instead of focusing your eyes on the future and seeing what God has called you to do, what God is calling you to be? See, how many of you, your eyes are down looking at the mud of the media instead of your eyes looking up to what God is saying in this hour that the church should be doing? We can be bowed down by all kinds of things. We can be bowed down by religion, tradition. We can be, I found so many people, they're bowed to traditions. They can't seem to break out of it. So what is holding you down? See, Jesus sees you and he sees that instead of standing up and living out your destiny and walking in the spirit and living a life that's powerful, your eyes are down and fixed on a problem, fixed on your past. How many are held down by their past? the things that you know about yourself. And you say, God, if, you got, if people knew, I'd be, my life would end. How many people are stuck, held down, and your vision is no longer on what God has called you to do and to be? He's called you to carry the life of the kingdom. It doesn't matter what political party is in charge. That doesn't change us. We're, we're from another kingdom anyway. You get caught up with all of the stuff that's going on instead of actually being focused on the king of kings, the kingdom, and the core as a son. A daughter, you're called into intimate relationship, hearing from God. As a son, a daughter, you're called to do an assignment. There's some people for you to go to. Assignments always mean a territory, a location. Assignments always mean a people you're sent to. That's why Jesus said, I've been sent by my Father. Christians need to live out of a life of being sent. I'm sent by God to do that work. I'm sent by God. My Father is behind me and backs me up. I can bring His presence into that environment into the business, into whatever. See, if you don't think that way, you're not thinking right. 
we're bowed by a religious type of tradition. This is an hour for the church to arise. This is our greatest hour. The darker it gets, the greater the light comes on us. But you've got to have a relationship with the Lord. You've got to be connected to Him. And if something is holding you down, it's time you heard His voice saying, arise, come, and let Jesus set you free. Let Him touch you in your life and bring a freedom to you. What is it holding you back? What is it holding you? Pride can hold us down. Pride keeps us focused on ourselves. See, bitterness keeps us focused on ourself. That's the first thing that God dealt with in Israel when they came out of years of slavery was the deep heart bitterness and the victim mindset. A victim mindset, poor me, someone else is to blame. I'm victimized, I'm oppressed. Listen, that kind of mentality holds people down. No one who has that mentality will go into the things of God. That's why Jesus, well, that's why in the Old Testament, they dealt with that as the first issue. Get rid of the bitterness in your heart. Get rid of the bitter disappointment. Someone who betrayed you, someone let you down. Betrayal can bow you down. Grief can bow you down. Disappointment can bow you down. There's there's no end to the things that can bow you down. But whatever bows you down, it's time you heard Jesus' voice. He saw her. That's what the Bible says. He saw her and he called her to himself. So maybe you're looking for someone to come through for you in some way. Jesus sees you and calls you to himself cause you back to center on him, back to relationship with him. And out of that touch of God, there's deliverance, there's healing. Things change in your life. That woman that day went out, nobody recognized her. She full of joy, full of life, full of hope for her future. He didn't just restore her body. He restored hope for the future again. This is what Jesus does. This is the kind of God we serve. And so we're not called to just attend church. If you're attending church, you're bowed down with religion. If you're coming to encounter God, you got your head straight. If you see that when you go out, you're going out on mission. It's not that you've got to talk to everyone about Jesus, but you're to carry what God is like to people. Generosity, kindness, forgiveness, blessing. See, we're called to do those things. And, And it's not hard because people are open. People are going through so many uh, hardship and difficulty. They're open for people who've got hope. They, they, they attract to you, and you attract them. It's just, it, it's most interesting to see what happens as you just set yourself, today I'm walking in assignment, and I see whoever comes into my zone today could be part of that assignment. I'm called to bless them, be kind to them, love them, show you what God is like. Be joyful in my heart and spirit. eh? But what's holding you down that stops you doing that? This is the hour. Arise, shine. eh? Arise, shine. No time to be shining. Not Not time to be miserable. Not time to be down. If you're miserable, something's got your face down to the ground. Get your eyes get back and center on the Lord again. So what do we need today to actually break out? Jesus invites every one of us to be part of the solution for others. But to do that, you need him to free you from what's holding you down. When you've got something sitting on your back, a spirit holding you down, you lose faith and vision, and you just go down like that. All you can see is what's in front of you. I I was just talking, I'll finish with one more story, then we'll, I was just praying for a a couple, uh, senior ministers, a very big church. There was a conflict going on in the family, and, uh, you know, they were reacting and whatever, and I won't go into the details of it, but they said, well, what do you think? And I said, you're about to make the biggest mistake of your ministry and your personal lives. Both of you come from broken backgrounds. And what's at stake is not this and that. What's at stake is, can you repair the damage of previous generations and build relational connection that will go through your grandchildren and great-grandchildren? It doesn't matter what you're doing in the church. If you can't restore that, you're a one-generation person. They were shocked. They were shocked. I said, you must see multiple generations. If you're an older person here, you're not quitting. You need to be praying and finding ways to sow into the next generation. See, we never get off our assignment until you breathe your last word. You're always on assignment because you're always a child of God. You've always got someone you can bless, someone you can be kind to, someone you can make welcome, someone you can help. But, you know, the deeper your connection with the Lord goes, the more you can do to help other people. So no doubt there's people today just need that touch of God on you to get you free. So why don't we just close your eyes right now. If you're watching online, same thing. What's holding you down? 
Jesus sees you. He sees what's holding you down. Is it a spirit of infirmity? You're wrestling with something. Is it, is it fear? Is it grief? Grief can shut you down and cause such a loss of vision and hope. Is it bitterness? Is it betrayal? Is it some way you've been abused? What is it holds you down? What's got your face off the Lord and onto your problems? What's got you from looking heavenly and you're looking to the earth? What, what is pressing in on your life and makes it feel like you can't seem to break out of this? Give it a name. When did it come? That's what you need to break your agreement with. Holy Spirit, come right now and touch every heart here and awaken them. And those watching online, awaken them. In what ways, Lord, have we taken our eyes off you and got them fixed on what's in front of us on the ground? Show us where we lost our vision and faith, what came in and caused us to lose it. Show us, Lord, where things overwhelmed us that we've never been able to talk about. And even when we hear great messages, we can't respond. All we can see is the earth. Lord, today we're asking for you to come and set people free. For some of you, it may be a bitter division. It could be a divorce, a family breakup, abuse. There's so many ways that our eyes can go off the Lord and onto the pain and then onto the earth. And that's all we can see. Wouldn't it be wonderful if today you had an encounter with Jesus and that shifted off your life? You began to get into the presence of God and He started to speak to you and give you fresh vision and you begin to get hope again that that situation could be restored, that God could come into that. Maybe it's children or grandchildren who've gone off the rails. Don't see where they've gone wrong. Focus on Jesus and that you're a covenant prayer, an intercessor, and He will hear your prayer for that child or that grandchild that's gone so far. Your young person, what is holding you down right now? Someone broke your heart? Family broke up? Let God in there. Spirits come in where we break the laws of God, bitterness and hatred and so on. They come in where people are hurt and never deal with it. This would be your day to deal with it. Father, I just thank you right now. You're speaking to hearts. Amen. Can we still stand together? Just stand together. I feel his presence here. Holy Spirit, you're here to help. The same anointing that was on Jesus to set that woman free of infirmity is here now. If that's you today and you know God's speaking to you, why don't you come? Just come to the front. Whether it's a physical sickness, it was a real infirmity, whether it's something that's weakened you and you feel you've got no strength in the face of these problems you're facing, you say, I'm coming, Lord, I'm coming to you. I hear your voice. Just come, come, make a row across the front, and you begin to just worship the Lord. Put your focus on Him, not on me. Come, just come. I sense many people with many different things. I see a number of people with fear and anxiety. Some of you, that was your mother that was like that. You've just carried that same fear and anxiety, so it refocuses you all the time. You can't enjoy the things of God. I see someone here, and you're struggling. You've had a very bad experience, and, and you don't sleep properly. God wants to heal you. I see someone else here, and there's like a torment going on in your mind of unclean things, and God wants to set you free. Get your eye off that. Put your eyes on what it means to be a man, woman of God. Is there anyone else? Just come, come. Perhaps for some of you, it was in a church. What happened to you so deeply wounded you, you can't get your eyes back on the Lord. It's fixed on someone's failure. Whatever it is, you say, I'm coming. Lord, I'm coming. That's me. Listen, I've had that. I had three ministers I served and, and loved fall into adultery. And I had to overcome the feelings of betrayal feelings of distrust and discover God again as a loving father and begin to trust people again. Someone else resting with deep loneliness. You've been lonely for many, many years because of what happened in your family. 
you shut up your heart and closed your heart. God's just wanting to heal you today. So just while you're here standing, keep your eyes closed. Don't look at me. It's Jesus called the woman to himself. Is there a problem? Name what it is you need God to touch you in. Name it. Is there some sin you need to repent of? Just do it quietly now. Is there someone you need to forgive? They did something unspeakable and unthinkable, and you're wrestling with that. Why don't you just say, God, help me. I just choose to forgive and let it go right now. Would you do that? Perhaps for someone else, you're held in the addiction of drugs, held into addiction of some kind. Say, God, I need to be free. Help me. See, his presence is here right now. We're going to come along and lay hands on you and pray for you. I'm going to lead you in a corporate prayer, first of all. When we finish the corporate prayer, I'll pray a prayer of release over you. Then we're going to come lay hands on you individually. It's not a counseling session. It's an encounter session. We want you to experience God. Just follow me together in prayer. Not only the ones at the front, but also others as well. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I want you to do for me what Jesus did for that woman. Set her free. Healed her. Honored her. I'm asking, Lord, that you would set me free. Heal my broken heart. Restore honor to me. Lord, today in Jesus' name, I repent of holding sin in my heart. I repent of any agreement I've made with destructive spirits. I forgive those who have hurt me. I release them now. And I reach out to you for freedom, for healing, for deliverance. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's just flow into worshiping the Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I take authority now over generational curses. I break them in Jesus' name. Tormenting spirits of witchcraft, fear, grief, I command you to go. Spirits of infirmity, I command you to go. Spirits of suicide, addiction, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit.